Welcome to Eye Contact, a video news programme on issues and controversies in ophthalmology sponsored by Eurotimes. I'm Dr Alistair Laidlaw. We're here at the 16th Congress of Ureta in Copenhagen. This year, Professor José Cunavaz from Quimbra University Hospital, Quimbra in Portugal, delivered the keynote Uretinal Lecture. He chose to speak about the blood retinal barrier in retinal disease management. Welcome, José. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Systemic diseases and diseases affecting blood vessels are a vital part of retinal problems. Can you tell us more about the blood retinal barrier? Uh, okay, it's not only systemic disease in, it, in general, it's the fact that the blood retinal barrier is crucial to uh, protect the retina. The retina is a very elaborate uh, system to, of uh, transmitting uh, the light, uh, transmitting the electrical signal from the light uh, induction in the photoreceptors into the brain. It must be on a very conditioned environment. And therefore, it needs particular protection. Let's say, for instance, to make a rapid uh, uh, image, uh, any time a lady blushes, the, the retinal vessels would be blushing too and would be changing <laughs> and sending signals to the, the, to, the, to the brain and changing the, 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 the vision, that you, what you are looking at. And that is protected by that blood retinal barrier. Any effect that is done with emotions and everything that change, rapid changes are protected. That's one way, but I think it gives you an idea that this environment has to be ideal. And to be ideal, it has a special protection system. And the protection system is the blood retinal barrier. And which diseases specifically are causing problems with the blood retinal barrier? I would say any situation that causes drastic changes in the body would be affecting the retina if the blood retinal barrier was not there. The blood retinal barrier is, is a, very similar to the blood brain barrier. Therefore, what you are really seeing is a, a, a situation that the retina, like in the brain, has this requirement of specific, specific requirements of ideal environment and is really, in a sense, a gatekeeper for any toxic, for anything that is circulating in the body. For, uh, uh, to maintain the, the, the best conditions. Uh, and every, every situation that, again, that uh, reaches uh, abnormal levels mm -hmm. in the body would, that would affect the retina if there was no blood retinal barrier. And so, when it is changed, when there is a breakdown, small it, it, as it is in the retina, then it's a very bad consequences to the, the retina and the photoreceptors. So is this specifically the disease of blood vessels that I might think about, like diabetes and vein occlusion, Absolutely. or is it extending no, into the more know, structural it, things? Every, let me put uh, again uh, an idea. Age-related macular degeneration causes changes because the, it causes the development of new vessels. New vessels, as by definition, don't have a blood retinal barrier, yes. which means they don't protect the retina. On the contrary, they allow amounts of fluid to come into the retina. And these amounts of fluid are the ones that are disrupting. The, it's like uh, plumbing. Yes. <laughs> you have uh, uh, bad vessels. plumbing is not good. And you also, I'm sure you get very worried when you have uh, some problems with plumbing. Absolutely. And uh, that's what uh, blood retinal barrier is doing, is really keeping your plumbing so, functioning. So what's the development in imaging that I, as a clinician, can use to uh, investigate and treat change in the blood yeah, retinal barrier? Yeah, uh, fluorescein angiography was crucial. It really changed completely the picture and has been used for many years. And uh, uh, fluorescein angiography has shown where these changes are happening, these breakdowns, these little sites of leakage, and you call leakage. Now, although CT, microangiography, you have the advantage that you don't need to inject anything. You can you be non-invasive. You can do repeated examinations in a relatively short interval without any arm, yes. short, rapid examinations, and very more convenient for the patient. Uh, and with OCT microangiography, I have shown that it's possible to measure also non-invasively the uh, leakage. You, you detect it with OCT lab technique. 
that is complementary to the OCT leakage and can be the, or the OCT microangiography and can be done with the same instrument. And so, yes. So with with OCT angiography, we're seeing the blood vessels right. and we see them beautifully. Right. But with OCT, we're we, seeing the effect of the leakage in most conditions, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. So, All this combined the, the information, that's what is uh, attractive. You 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 can you see with OCT microangiography, you see the the blood cells moving in the vessels. That's the only thing you see. Then with the OCD leakage, you can see the fluid accumulating. Yeah. Where to detect it would be very convenient always for the plumber to see where the, the fluid is. He was looking is where the water is accumulating. And that's what we try to do with OCD leakage. And having this information on fluid accumulation, on the, how the vessels are functioning with, the, with OCT macrogeography, and the fact that you have also OCT uh, in general giving the image on the scans of the structural damage, mm. of the architectural mm. damage of the retina, you, you really have complementary information that gives you a better handle of the disease and much more information for your decisions to treat, your decisions to follow that patient, or worried you should be with that patient or not. So in 2018, Am I going to need to do any fluorescein angiograms? I, 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 you know, fluor I have a lot of respect for fluorescein angiography because I think it has contributed a lot. You may still, you, there is one thing that we need now, as these techniques come on, we, we need more and more to, to have a common language, to understand yes. it fully. And that is not there yet. And we need to communicate, you have to make a lexicon a new lexicon yes. for, uh, for these techniques. Uh, and therefore, it will take some time. I would say 2018, your question, which means within two years, may our meeting would be where? In 2018, I don't remember exactly. Next year is in Barcelona in 2018. I don't know. I, I suppose you probably only do floor scene in geography if you want we have a question, something you don't understand, something is not clear, something once seen, uh, uh, somehow to have a reference in your patient. The first time you see that patient, if it is a diabetic, mm. but I would use less and less. Clearly. So it's moving further down the investigation algorithm. Absolutely. So now if we can change tactic, topic a bit, yes. um, you're, you're very interesting because you've been president of the European Society of Cataract and Refractive yes. Surgeons and then the president of Uretina. Yes. Uretina has seen remarkable growth with what, 5,000, one or 200 people here this year. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's, it's been a very rewarding experience for me. As a matter of fact, I, I have, let's say, what I take some pride on is the fact that uh, when I was invited to become president of cataract and refractive surgery, uh, I was doing at time uh, some uh, surgery on that area, and uh, then I uh, came in contact with direct contact with Agenda, uh, with uh, the office in uh, Ireland, and it, they did a great job with cataract and refractive. And when I finished my period on cataract and refractive, I was on the board of the retina, and I thought, what? That's what you need. We just need to get Agenda on board and to have your retina on the board of agenda because i had lived for eight years i moved twice to the united states i was supposed to stay and then return with my family it's very confusing but during that period i realized that the big difference between united states meetings and european were organization if you you need to have uh, um, someone that is professional, yeah. managing your uh, every feature, organization of the meeting, uh, participation, all these different components, you need organization. If, if I can butt in, I think you're being very modest because what I see as being the strength of your retina is that there was a group of very academic European professors who saw the need for an educational meeting at a time when there was a vast explosion of, um, of activity in retina. I think we've got to put that down to people like Gisbert, Ricard, yourself, um, and August, others August in terms Dyke, of, one, yes, one of all these, yeah, leading, all the, all leading the field and producing a but, fantastic educational meeting. Yeah, I think this, but this was something that everyone 
believed yeah, in. It takes it's a lot of It's not one guy or yes. two guys. Everyone understood that. As a matter of fact, I, I, <laughs> I don't know uh, if not is, is interesting or not, but to initiate, I was more attached to the Macular Society in the United States. I was a member and was one of the few members at the time in Europe. And I tried to organize a Macular Society in, before the Retina. And the Macular Society is a different concept and we started having a meeting in Coimbra and another one in Greece. Then when uh, August Deutmann and Regis Bert came up with the idea of having this meeting in Hamburg, that really everyone felt comfortable bringing surgery together with yes. medical retina, and that's how we go, it was going. But I, I really believe that the growth lies more, lied more in the, the contribution of industry yeah. and the new it's drugs awesome. and new options for treatments yes. than it, it really in ourselves as much as we want to do great things, but we can only do what we can. Thank you for joining us. For more information on this and related topics, please visit us at eurotimes.org.